Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm very impressed about how fluently you speak Polish. My compliments. Um, I wonder whether I need the microphone. Can we turn it a little down? Is it better now? Yeah. We had lunch with a group of CEOs, and one of them asked me, is this your first visit to Vaso? It's not exactly my first visit. It's about the 40th or 50th visit. <laughs> and the first time I came to Warsaw was in a very different world. That was 1986. And um, then I had this afternoon the pleasure to visit the presidential, presidential palace and was very impressed. But now we are back at our topic, pricing in the digital age. And my presentation is very simple. Um, first, we look at this well-known formula, profit equals price times volume minus cost, and ask the question, how does digitization influence the drivers of profit? And I will sort of systematically, in a simple way, think through the effects of the internet and e-commerce on the drivers of pricing. First, price perception changes because we have a radically increased price transparency. It's very easy to inform yourself about prices of all kinds of outlets and products. The value perception which drives the volume also changes, mostly through customer feedback. And then, on the cost side, we have a rather or a radically new phenomenon, zero marginal cost. I will not speak much about that. That would be a lecture on its own. But in the old world, zero marginal costs were very rare, at best for software. Even in an empty hotel room or an empty airline seat didn't have really marginal zero marginal costs because you had to clean the hotel room, you needed new towels, etc. The first um, aspect is quite obvious, increased price transparency. And I found this quote from Steve Ballmer, until last year's CEO of Microsoft, quite uh, a call to reality. This thing called price is really, really important, he said. The companies that make money in the digital age are deep in understanding the price and business model. I think that's neglected generally, and I only can confirm this. Um, I was in Boston last week in the Harvard Business School, and I went to the bookstore in the Harvard Coop, large store, thousands of books, and um, the marketing section was three shelves. Um, I would say three, four, five hundred books on marketing. Of those, at least 100 were on advertising. How many were on pricing? Exactly one. That was my book, Confessions of the Pricing. Truly, I, I looked through the three shelves, one book on pricing. And I would say pricing has a much stronger impact on profit, for most products at least, than advertising. Lesson one, the fundamental role of price as the most effective profit driver does not change in the digital age. But the perception of price and value to customer can change radically. And I will go deeper into this. Understanding these changes is indispensable for optimal pricing in the digital age. Now, the strongest current effect is, of course, price transparency. That's obvious. Everybody knows that. How does that change the game? And that's a little theoretical, but we employ about 1,000 people with this theory. That's the demand or price response curve, price here, sales volume there, and let's assume this is the price to date or the competitor's price. And this is the price response curve in the old world. What changes? 
if price transparency is increased, price comes more into the perception, to the foreground, and we look at price cuts or prices below the competitive price, the price curve becomes steeper. Or in theoretical terms, the price elasticity increases. So if we cut price, more people see it, more people at the lower price will buy our product. On the upper side, the opposite happens. Also, more people will perceive the price, see it's more expensive, we are lower on the price scale, think of uh, air travel, etc. And we sell less, or it's more difficult to increase price. So this means we get generally a higher price sensitivity or price elasticity, or relative to competition, cross price elasticity. We will see more intensive competition, especially price competition. And it may be that value differences, the value of the product is moved to the background because the price becomes the dominant factor, even more dominant than it was in the, in the old world. Consequences for pricing, if we just look at the situation as it is, aggressive prices get advantages. And we, we usually say, oh, higher price elasticity is bad, higher price elasticity is good for somebody who prices aggressively, who undercuts competition. This person, this seller, wants high price elasticity because it increases the volume. And of course, the reverse side, bigger disadvantages for expensive providers. Dynamic, if we look at changes, price reductions have a stronger positive effect. Price increases have a stronger negative effect. So very asymmetric for undercutters and uh, higher prices. We will see more price changes simply because the price has a stronger effect and price wars are more likely. I mean, some wars uh, are about getting on the first place in the, in the price ranking and all this. So from the pure side of price transparency, we have radical changes. Lesson two, the currently strongest effect of digitization is a radically increased price transparency. It leads to a massively increased price elasticity. This makes it more attractive for price aggressive sellers to reduce prices. It makes it much harder for high price sellers to successfully increase prices or de defend their higher price levels. The danger of price wars is higher. The effects of higher price transparency. Now, what is the most important aspect of pricing? What do you think? I have been asked this question thousands of times. People ask me, what is the most important aspect of pricing? It's not the price as such. It's value to customer. The price people are willing to pay is always the reflection of the perceived value to customer. If you perceive a higher value, you are willing to pay more. If you perceive a lower value, you say, I only buy this product if I get it cheaper at lower price. And the Romans understood this equation. That's the same word for price and value. Who learned Latin here? Did you remember? I didn't remember. I detected so. I, I also learned Latin at school, but I had forgotten what uh, the word for price or it's pretium. Pretium equals value equals price. That's the same word. And if you go home and simply remember this equation for your business, you have learned enough for today. Because that is the core equation of pricing. And that now leads us to the value side. Value delivery is what we give to the customer, and value extraction, what do we get back? Is that enough to give us a reasonable profit? Or do we deliver more than we get back? Do we deliver less? That's an equation which has to be balanced. 
So lesson three, that's only a reminder. In the digital age, value to customer is likely to remain the central factor of pricing. The perception of value will change. The perception of price changes. But the equation remains. It is of the utmost importance to fully understand and precisely measure how digitization affects the perception of price and of value to customer. And now we come to value to customer. And I have to make a few preliminary remarks. In 1937, a German guy called by the name of Domitzlaff, he published a book, How to Gain the Trust of the Public. And there, he distinguished between two types of merchants. One was a traveling dealer, who just passed through, stayed one day, two days, usually at a, at a fest when there was a market in the town, sold bad products at a high price, and the next day he had disappeared. He called, in German, he calls this type the Jahrmarktsverkäufer. Can you, can, is that translatable? Yeah. The other is a local dealer, he called him der ortsansässige Kaufherr, the merchant who stays in the town or the village. He cannot afford this behavior because if he sells bad products at a high price, he will go bankrupt. Whereas this guy comes back after a year and people have forgotten it again, are in the mood of buying, etc. Then I hold that in the digital age, traveling and treating dealers will not survive in the long term. And I explain why. Another visionary book was this book. Probably nobody of you has seen that. The Clue Train Manifesto published in the year 2000. And it didn't become a bestseller because I think it was too early. It says here, the end of business as usual. What is the main hypothesis there? That there is a new conversation between customers like in a village. So the phenomenon of the traveling dealer and the local merchant, which existed only on a very small scale, where you had personal exchange between people, becomes a global phenomenon. And uh, another visionary was the communication scientist, Marshall McLuhan, who introduced the term of the global village in 1962. They said communication technology will lead to an exchange of communication on a global scale like in a village. And that came only true 40, 50 years later with, with the internet. Now, on the internet, we have this feedback of the customer. You can find out what other customers think about a product, what their experiences are at your fingertips. We have various pages. You have pages like on Amazon or eBay where this is part. You have neutral pages. Yelp, for instance, is extremely inf influential in the US. Uh, TripAdvisor, uh, for hotels, you get feedbacks for, for everything. Um, in, in the US, you can even find it for the smallest stores on Yelp or in your, in your uh, local situation. So what may become the more important long-term effect of digitization on pricing? Radically increased value transparency. What does this mean for the curve? Again, we look at the curve in the old world, with low value transparency, where it was difficult to find out what other people thought about a certain product or service. Now what happens if a product or service gets mostly negative feedback? When they cut the price, that will not have a positive effect or a very small positive effect on sales. Because if you get negative feedback on a hotel, you will not book this hotel even if it's cheap. 
On the other sa side, if you want to charge a high price or increased price for negatively evaluated product, you will fall off the cliff. It means that price loses its ability as, a, as an effective competitive weapon. If you are negatively judged by most people, price becomes ineffective. What happens in the opposite direction? If you get very positive feedback, you cut your price, you will sell more than in the old world, and you can afford to increase your price without lo losing as much as in the old world. So we have highly asymmetric effect for negative feedback and positive feedback. But there is another asymmetric effect, namely what we call fatal silence. It's much more likely that people express a negative experience on the internet than their positive experience. As said in this quote, happy customers keep quiet, whereas unhappy customers voice their anger loudly and quickly. Bad product or service ratings spread through the internet rapidly and are widely perceived. At the same time, consumers look at positive ratings only briefly and click away at the slightest atmospheric disturbance. So this means, in addition to the asymmetric effect, it's much more likely if you offer bad quality or the customer is dissatisfied that you are punished, that the traveling or cheating dealer disappears. Positive customer feedback creates pricing power. And uh, Warren Buffett, the famous American investor, said the following, the single most important aspect in evaluating a business is pricing power. You have the ability to get the price, to increase the price if your costs go up, to earn a decent profit. That's pricing power. In one of our studies, we found that only 33% of the companies say that they have pricing power. They can increase the prices to the level they need to make a decent profit. Value perception creates pricing power. Now, what are the consequences for pricing? Sellers with bad ratings do not stand a chance even with aggressive prices. With negative ratings, price ceases to be an effective weapon. Price elasticity goes actually down. Sounds strange, but that's a fact. Price increases and in disaster, price elasticity goes up. The opposite is true if you get mostly positive ratings. You sell more at constant prices. You can implement price increases and lose less volume than in the old world. Price elasticity goes up. Or price cuts have a stronger effect. Price elasticity goes up here. That is wrong. This must be price elasticity goes down, of course. Yeah. So it has very strong effect on profit. I think the main lesson here is, by all means, you have to avoid negative feedback, which can only be achieved if you offer true value, true service, good service. It will become very difficult to cheat because customers actually perceive what you're offering them. It's not just like the traveling salesman who sells you something and then he disappears. Lesson four. The internet will radically increase value transparency. This process has only just begun. We are in a very early stage of this. The cheating dealer will disappear, only the honest dealer will survive and flourish. Of course, a cheating dealer will do his business for a certain time until he is revealed and detected. Uh, then he may reappear under another name, but it's not a sustainable strategy. Value transparency has extremely asymmetrical effects on price elasticity. You need to understand and pay attention to these asymmetries. Striving for positive feedback becomes crucial for pricing, or even more in a sense of survival, avoiding negative feedback. Now let me look very shortly at new price models in the digital age. Um, this is a very complex theme. I have a whole chapter on this in the, in the book. Um, 
over history, we have very rarely seen pricing innovations. Uh, bundling was first introduced in the film industry around 1920. Uh, from selling to leasing occurred for the first time around uh, 1880 when the singer sold uh, sewing machines uh, on monthly installments. Uh, but now in the last 10, 15 years we have seen an, a, a tsunami of new uh, pricing systems, flat rates, uh, very popular. Um, each of these new methods should be considered with a lot of caution. Um, flat rates are very dangerous if you don't have zero marginal costs, but even if you have that, you may sacrifice a lot of the higher willingness to pay because the intensive users profit mostly. So from both sides, from the willingness to pay and the cost side, flat rates are also dangerous. Freemium, the big challenge with freemium, where you have a base product free and uh, a paid product with, with more features, is how to construct these two products. If you make the free product too attractive, you attract a lot of free users, but uh, don't convert them to pay, and you, you make only money from the paid users. Um, if it's too unattractive, the free product, you will not attract enough free users. You will have a high conversion rate. So that is a difficult balance. Dynamic pricing, very important price, which changes over time according to utilization. Pay per use is also a very interesting model, which is not only a matter of digitization, but also of sensor technologies. How can you measure? Uh, I always use an example. I grew up on a very small farm in the 1950s. And when I was a child, our water was priced on the number of human and cattle heads because there were no water meters. And when the water meter was introduced in the, in the early 60s, actual consumption was. That is a, a case which explains how important sensor measurement technologies can be for actual pay of use, and that is, of course, much more sophisticated. You can go on the internet to individualize pricing because you identify the person. A very important is two-dimensional pricing. A case is Amazon Prime, where you pay, do you have that in Poland, Amazon Prime? In Germany, it costs uh, 49 uh, euros, in the US, $99. And uh, for the duration of one year, you get certain discounts, uh, freebies, Etc. Um, new price metrics. Um, we often use an example from Michelin, the tire manufacturer, um, who prices certain truck tires not on per unit but on kilometers driven, or in the case of aircraft um, tires, on the number of landings. We have all kinds of interactive pricing methods, aus auctions, name your own price, uh, pay what you want. Negative prices is a new phenomenon, uh, which is partially driven by marginal zero cost, but partially also by technology. For instance, in the last uh, year, or in the last years, we had approximately 30 days each year with negative prices for electric power. Can you imagine that? There's in Leipzig is the European Power Exchange, and on 30 days, if you took electric power, you got paid by the company which generates the power. Uh, because, for instance, if you have a solar plant, you must find somebody who takes the power, and if there's no equilibrium between demand and supply at a price of zero, you have to go to a negative price. So totally new phenomena. Sharing economy, Uber, etc., Airbnb, and new pay payment systems will also have an effect that can be very simple systems like Amazon One Click, where the payment does not occur. Or if you use Uber, um, you, you don't pay, you, you, you order the car and you just get out the car and the payment is automatic. And that also has effects on the price perception. So lesson five, 
Throughout history, pricing innovations have been rare and spread very slowly. In the digital age, we are experiencing an explosion of new pricing and payment systems. Numerous new technologies and tricks work extremely well in e-commerce, but when you apply these methods, the complexity and the information requirements increase massively. The increased complexity brings great opportunities, but also substantial risk. My last aspect, how can an e-commerce dealer survive against Amazon? Is Amazon in Poland? Are they here? Are they active in Germany? They are very, very, very big. Um, it's difficult. You can offer higher value, for instance, by giving personal advice. Here is a case. Uh, I, I use here three examples from furniture where you think e-commerce doesn't play such a big role. They combine internet and personal advice, so you see the person you talk to on the, on the screen. Hidden champion strategy means you are very focused, very uh, successful in Germany is tea campaign. They sell only uh, organic tea. Fairly hopeless is it to beat Amazon convenience. Impossible also in price. Brand can offer chance if you really have a, a strong brand. Um, combination internet and stationery. Though I have to admit I don't see the big advantages here. Uh, just where do I buy besides, I, I order a lot uh, at Amazon, but I order also at some special stores like truckstores.com, occasionally with Zalando, which has more or less the same approach as Amazon. Best silver, that is actually not silver, it's, um, it's actually socks with silver. Amazon does have, that's a furniture company, I come back to this and, for instance, dietary supplements. So I have a couple of suppliers, but all specialized, rather hidden champion strategy than broad. Um, there are huge opportunities. This is a case of a, of a furniture retailer. This means furniture cheaper. He started in 2005, and he had only a stationary job in a small village in a, in a rural area. His turnover, his revenue was five million at that time. Now he makes 50 million. And his model is roughly as such. He doesn't keep the furniture in store. People order on the internet, and it's directly transported from the factory to the consumer, so he saves a lot of cost. He saves about 40% and shares that with the consumer, so he sells branded furniture at a discount of 20%. Well, this case is unbelievable. I learned that last week in Harvard. Casper.com, they just sell a mattress, but they compress it so that it has the largest size which UPS still transports. The idea, young guys developed that in 2013. The, the CEO is 26 years old, product introduction in 2014, revenue in 2015, 200 million dollars and market capitalization 500 With a mattress, can you think of a more trivial or banal product? Compressed to the size of you need in, in e-commerce. Lesson six, live in e-commerce is not easy if you are up against a giant like Amazon. However, a number of promising approaches have shown that it is possible to survive and to be successful. Even in the digital age, we will not exclusively see monopolies. Without massive cost advantages or superb financial resources, price wars should be avoided. This is as true in the digital age as in the old world. Summary, in the digital age, as in the old economy, price remains the most effective profit driver. Value to customer remains the most important aspect of pricing. Understand, create and communicate value. That remains as important as ever. Increased price transparency is currently the strongest effect on pricing. This effect favors price-aggressive providers. Fact. In the long run, the more important effect may be better value transparency. With highly complex implications, the sheeting dealers will not survive in the digital age. 
There are ways to survive against the powerful e-commerce competition. Success examples show. I showed you three examples from the unlikely furniture area. It can be done. Unless you have lower costs or are financially stronger, price wars should be avoided as in the old economy. So that was my short overview, some thoughts. Um, are you presenting Simon Kutcher here? So, uh, otherwise, I could just go through it. Yeah? Um, I was a professor in my first life for 16 years, and I thought I should apply it for what I'm doing in pricing research, and we formed Simon Kutcher and Partners. Dr. Kutcher was my first doctoral student, student with the clear goal to become market leader, focus on pricing global presence. Today, we are the recognized leader in marketing pricing sales in Germany and also in France in the new study. And in the US, we are number three now. In the world, we are world leader in price consulting. This is our growth curve. We are now close to 1,000 people. Our revenue last year was 209 million euros or 232 million uh, dollars. And uh, we have 33 offices in the world now in 24 countries. So we are the number one in this field. And uh, you get the book. I've signed some. I don't have now, regrettably, the time to sign the others, maybe next time. And if you want to follow me, I share my ideas at Twitter under Herman Simon. So, Cinque, thank you very much. We have time for one question, I would say. For, a long, for one long one or three short ones. Mm -hmm. It's true, Hermann has a flight waiting, so... Uh. Hi, Michael Aris from the Omnibus. Uh, we are now in a pricing set time for our new product. All of the theories and practical aspects uh, which you mentioned actually already good in quite established business. Uh, what can we do with, to set the price for a new product which has no price elasticity and no yeah, market history? What would be your hint for us? So the fundamentals are the same as for a new product in the old world. You have to understand the value. And uh, I, I, I'm currently developing a talk on the philosophy of pricing and I say today 95% our, of our pricing is Marxian, Karl Marx pricing. Some of you may still be familiar with the labor value theory that the value of the product is defined by the labor invested into the production of the product. That's essentially cost price pricing. The core is understanding the value. If you don't understand the value, you are fishing in muddy waters. And that applies in the internet. In the internet, you can test more, but it applies fundamentally in the internet as it did in the old world. Understanding the value is the core. Just a quick question, because every purchase uh, is based on emotion. Um, do you take that into account when you look for the value for customers? Of course. I mean, brand, emotion. For many products, that's the most important factor, of course. I mean, value is nothing a technical value. It's the whole comprehensive value. Emotion, prestige effect. If you buy this product, are you improving your prestige in your social group, etc. of course. Uh, that may, again, be a different game in the internet than in a traditional distribution channel. Yeah.